No, I am a light sleeper. I do not sleep under normal circumstances. And it is only rarely that I can sleep for durations lasting over an hour. So it was no surprise to me when I was roused from a vivid dream early this morning. I lay still for a moment as the dream faded from my memory. For I have learned not to try to consolidate my dreams anymore. They are too bizarre. And I do not want to overwhelm my mind with such archetypal conceptions that only exacerbate my already active mind. I lay still for a moment, but the dream did not dissolve like they usually do and the dream only became more and more vivid in my mind until I could no longer ignore it. The dream was not an image, however. It was a sound, an amorphous, pale, relenting sound surrounded by dense, semi-transparent blackness that filled my mind with dread. The sound, I realized, was coming from the flock. It was the sheep. They were in danger and they were calling to me for help. I cannot fathom how they were able to produce this sound in my head. And then I realized that they were not responsible for producing the sounds, but that the sound was a manifestation of the fear and despair within the collective body of sheep, and that it was a larger system of which the body of sheep was but a subset, a component. My uneasiness grew until the fear began to penetrate me and make me afraid, for I was part of the same system now. Now fully awake, I sat up in bed and listened carefully to the sound and tried to hear the characteristics, the minute frequencies to which this unearthly pitch belonged. The sound was undefined and impossibly complex, like the sound of coordinated noise. But it was the texture, the impossible denseness that made this so unnerving to me. I then realized that it was this depth that made this sound so frightening and that it was this depth that truly brought this sound into existence. What I was hearing was a deeper reality, a deep field created by the pressure of the universe pushing against itself. This is the sound of the world, the sound of that disturbing record hidden away in that shed. I jumped out of bed and dressed quickly. It was still dark, but the vast glow from the firmament gave enough illumination for me to see through an eerie blue light. Then I went outside, the sheep were there scattered all about, some of them sleeping and some of them wandering about listlessly. They did not seem frightened. On the contrary, they took no notice of me at all. The scent of bell heather was strong and the sheep slept well beneath its restorative powers. Carefully winding my way through the flock, I went up to the promontory and sat down against the fence post. Then I took out a cigar and trimmed it. And lighting it, I let my mind wander across the vastness and unchanged beauty of the land. Even in this semi-darkness, I could see the outlines of the dark hills, their depth the ancient, desolate emptiness between them. And I wondered what secrets they contained and what secrets they would never reveal but instead lie dormant until the weak 
pale moonlight call them forth again. My own home is nothing like this. My own home is small, cramped, densely populated and filled with stress, anger, violence, and rage. The rage had driven me from my own home. But I know that most things do change. Most things develop and transform into something unlike that from which they were taken. I know this is how the world works. And I do not like it. And I do not accept it. The air was cold and I sipped up my sweater. I wanted to enjoy the moment of solace, but the thought of my own home continued to haunt me, and even here, even in this most remote place I could find, I could not come to terms with my anxiety. I was truly connected to my home, I reasoned, and the connection only became stronger through time and distance, like some weird scientific inverse square law. Yes, I knew of cosmological theories that hypothesized that everything was connected and that everything was one thing, one single electron. But now I wondered if this also included living things. People. Thoughts like this bother me and keep me awake at night. But I am no better for having had them or from entertaining them. And they sometimes separate me and my thoughts from my wife. But I am not to blame for these thoughts have also given me balance I need in my life to cope with such moments of melancholia. Moments that separate me from my own inner fears. To the sound of the nocturnal creatures of the night, my mind wandered. Just a single lonely man beneath the rising smoke of a faintly glowing cigar. Quantum field dynamics has been proven to be consistent and ubiquitous, even in empty space. The Casimir effect, measured as zero-point energy, has already been measured, so it has to be true. It's axiomatic. Non-locality has also been established within particle accelerators and within supercomputers, all pointing to the same thing. Entanglement, a single, unyielding quantum system defined ever more precisely by our ability to observe it. Even in empty space, because emptiness is impossible and is filled with virtual particles that may be entangled halfway across the universe, If this is true, and science says that it is, then this means that the universe has to have been created out of consciousness from outside of the system. For quantum probabilities do not collapse until observed, and that every particle entangled within this superconsciousness is connected. One. These thoughts have never been so clear in my mind, but I knew then that they could not be true, and I did not want them to be true. Absurd as this may sound, it does point to the existence of a creator, the watchmaker. My mind kept turning and turning this idea over and over until another thought made me stop and take notice. The thing that separates the recognition of this truth is our sense of identity, our 
our soul. But if this really is true, then even our soul is part of a universal consciousness. And our very soul is also an illusion inside the consciousness of the Creator. Thinking these thoughts always makes me sad, melancholy. But I could not stop the process, the systematic, endless cross-examination of things beyond my control, and for the most part, beyond any reasonable purpose. I cannot change the universe by thinking about it, and I cannot change my endless, useless examination of my place in the universe by thinking about it. Thinking about it only evokes further, deeper questions. I try to be free, to define myself as if I am unique and separate. But if this distinguishing feature of me is nothing but an illusion, and that to maintain it I must sacrifice the truth, the mind is Still, we tear it apart, break it down, rip it to pieces, and reconstruct it according to our ever-changing whims. But this operation is futile, and the truth only becomes more and more obvious to me. Loneliness is useful to me, but it often takes me to places I would rather not go and prevents me from sleeping lest I go there. The wind was picking up as this thought continued to develop, and I was becoming uneasy. If this is all true, then I am not a person. I am a thing. I stood up and shook the idea out of my mind. Some of the sheep were wandering their way from the cottage into the dark hills, and I followed them. After following them for almost two hours through the thick gorse, highland grasses and pink moss, stumbling across the rocky slopes and trying not to fall down, I was far away from the cottage. But I stopped and took notice of my position. I knew that I was deeply cut off from the rest of the world and that I was uniquely lost from the rest of civilization. I could see why someone would seek out this level of isolation, this total separation, if they were antisocial or if they were running away from something. But for me, I was disturbed by it. The sheep were all together in a bowl-like depression, nibbling the wild grasses between the stones, and strangely I felt comfort by their presence. I sat down to rest. Rocks were strewn about like a debris field of some forgotten lunar landscape, and everywhere the heather, the fragrant purple heather. There was nothing like this where I lived, and I drank in the substance of such desolate beauty. And this was not frightening like I had been led to believe by those for whom the pagan gods and elder things were part of their existence, part of the essence of this dreamlike, surreal landscape. I had no cigar with me, so I closed my eyes for a few minutes to rest. I woke with a start, for one of the sheep was making a noise I had never heard before, and the sound was disquieting and frightening, for I had the sense that the sheep was trying to communicate with me and to make me aware of danger. In a moment, I was on my feet, and I tried to see if the presence of a predator had frightened the sheep. 
but I could see nothing. The frightened baying of the sheep had now turned into a soft quiver, and I found this sound even more disturbing. Terror feeds upon terror, I know this. It is part of our primitive brain, and it is the reason we have survived as a species. Terror knows itself, and suddenly I was overcome by an instinct to flee from my life. And I did. I fled right to the sheep's head. And within two hours, I was ready for a drink and some light conversation to forget my growing anxiety and existential anxiety. After ordering a dram and a pint, I looked around the tavern for a familiar face. But no one looked familiar to me. Has Alien been here today? I asked the proprietor. Not today, sir, he answered. Over here, mate, I heard someone call in a loud voice. He was looking directly at me. Ilian is our friend. Come over here and share a dram or two with us. Four men, none of whom I recognized, sat together drinking. When I sat down, the conversation had turned to monsters. A stout man with a gray beard and thick lips was talking. When I could see that the other men were slightly annoyed with him. He was trying to tell a story. He looked directly at me. These locks are filled with serpents and sea monsters. Ask a Scotsman if he has seen a sea monster, and he will yawn. But if I were to tell you what I saw on Loch Lomond a few weeks ago, you would think me insane. Some of the men began to grumble, but he continued with the story. Now I was fishing for pike on the loch. We were in just outside of Balmaha, near the mouth of Endrick. I struggled most of the day with trout. Once in a while, a curious salmon and other fish I didn't care to catch. That is when we moved into deeper water, and that is when I finally dragged out a tremendous pike. Could have bitten off my entire arm, only to have it swallowed by a fantastically large creature hiding beneath my boat. Yea, there be serpents in these waters, he said at last. That pike wasn't ripped out of your hands, one of the men shouted. It was you that was ripped out of your mind. Everyone howled with laughter, even myself. But this was a well-worn story, and the men were tired of hearing it. When I told them I was a guest of the shepherd, they stopped speaking and eyed me queerly. I knew they were surprised, so I asked them, is there something wrong with the shepherd? He is a strange duck, said my new friend, whose name was Lucas. How well do you know him, he added. Not well, I admitted. I'll not ask you your business, Lucas said. I only say that he is a strange duck. I finished my whiskey and asked, in what way, Lucas? One of the men came back with more whiskey, and we all drank together. And then Lucas started to speak. He came in here a few years ago, back when he bought the cottage. He said that his name was M. I thought the name absurd. But to each his own, I reasoned, and I did not try to learn more. He came in from outside as the rain was beginning to fall one dark afternoon. We sat together and drank whiskey. After a couple hours, he began to tell me some peculiar things. His eyes are hawk-like, and I did not like to look at him. 
He said that the soul of a man could be saved and transmitted through time and through space and that such a man could theoretically live forever. I laughed, but he looked at me directly in the eyes and said, I am just such a man. Again, I laughed and asked him what his sheep thought about such an outlandish idea. He thought for a moment, and then he told me that his sheep were not interested in such things, but were very content to wander the hills and to think their own sheep thoughts. And that was not all. He said that he was working feverishly to hear the sound of God. I looked at him with a question, but he merely nodded. Then he said that the sound of God was all around us, but that we could not hear it. And then he said something even stranger. He said that he could hear the sound. I asked him what it sounded like, but he would not tell me. I've said too much, he answered. Every time I spoke to him after that, he would not talk about it. So I assumed that he was no longer working on it, and I stopped asking him about it. Haven't seen him around here in over a year. What is he doing? I lied to them. He is doing research for a book he is writing about animal husbandry, I answered. Then I got up and went to get us all another round of drinks. When I got back, thankfully, the subject had now changed to sports, and I pretended to be interested. But then Lucas grew serious and asked, Did you ever happen to see any weapons at the shepherd's cottage? Why do you ask? Em also said that sometimes at night, large creatures come down from the sky and carry the sheep away to be devoured. One night, a while back, I heard some tremendous reports of gunfire long into the night. This surprised me and caused me a bit of anxiety, but I pretended that I knew nothing of the weapons cache inside the cottage. I still don't trust him, Lucas said. He has too many stories, and I don't trust men that tell too many stories. But I trust men that drink whiskey, so how about another tram? Within an hour, I was drunk again. But I stayed for a few more hours. We all went outside to smoke, and I gladly accepted, for I had no cigar with me. I am not a smoker, so the slight narcotic effect of the cigarettes altered my mood considerably. They told stories about ghosts and spirits and sacred glens and rivers, but they were interested to hear stories about my home. Sadly, I had to tell them that we didn't have stories like these where I lived. Have come and gone, I speculated. Maybe we just don't remember. So instead, I told them stories about murder and mayhem, drive by shootings, revenge killings, honor killings, drug deals gone wrong, kidnappings, rapes, molestations, castrations, and all kinds of horrific content that filled the daily papers were satisfied as if in some small way I had entertained them. But the stories only made me depressed, for I did not want to put my mind in these terrible places anymore. Life is too short. But the more I drank, the more horrific my stories became, as if I were picking at an open wound bigger. I wanted to hear stories about saints and sinners and redemption. All the 
while expounding about the curious nature of the worst killers and most brutal treatment of innocent men and women and children. I was making myself sick. They saw my change of mood and I think they understood. And soon our conversation ended with a friendly handshake. After eating a dinner of fish and chips, I went back to the path that would take me back to the cottage. When I stumbled back to the cottage, the sheep were already there. I thought it strange. I went into the cottage, and there was M, patiently waiting for me. He looked at me stoically, but without accusation. I see that you have been drinking. Would you prefer to sleep a while before we talk? Instantly, I was sober. I was ashamed. His return had completely caught me off guard and I started to apologize. There is no reason to apologize, he said with a smile. It is not wrong to overindulge now and then. We have much to discuss. He led me to the comfortable sitting room in the back of the cottage. He offered me a tram, but I refused. Next, he offered me a cigar, and I also refused. On the table was a large leather satchel. He lay his hands on top, but he did not open it. Inside of this bag are documents. These are the documents I told you about. I cannot show them to you for now, but you must do something first. And I will tell you that in a few minutes. Once you have seen these documents, you will no longer be the same person you are today. These documents are the history of my forebearers, up to and including Myself. They are an accumulation of the wisdom included in the Book of Soren. But they are so much more than that. Things only referred to or alluded to within the book have been expanded, deciphered, and in some cases brought to reality. The instrument which lay in the studio is an example. But of course you know that already for you have touched it. A shock went through me. How could he have known this? I said nothing, however, and he continued. These documents have been handed down from generation to generation since the time of Melanthros. The bloodline of M has never been broken. Until now, I am childless, as you know, but it is not from lack of trying. Yes, I have been in love. Perhaps it is hard for you to believe this, but it is true. In truth, I was born with a genetic defect which prevents me from ever having children of my own. Of siblings, I have none but I have kept this book and this knowledge safe that I have been a good guardian. This book will survive, however, for I have given it to you. But these documents are the true legacy of this book, and I can only give them to an heir. Therefore, I have chosen you as my heir. If you should accept such a responsibility, I started to speak, but he held up a hand in a gesture to stop me. Let me finish, he said. I did not choose you in truth, be told. It was the Book of Sorn which chose you, for I dreamed of your coming long before you entered my shop. I 
have not even begun to explore the mysteries of this book. It is these here documents, these testaments, which will give you direction. My life is almost over, and I feel myself getting weaker every day. Tomorrow, I will drive you to the airport, for I have a car parked outside. You have a choice to make. In one scenario, you will go home without this satchel, and we will shake hands and be friends. The other scenario is that you shall bear this burden back home with you and further their exploration of the Book of Soren. For this to happen, I shall have to adopt you, and you shall be initiated into the lineage of my forefathers. And for this to happen, we will require a ceremony and vows to be taken. Tonight is not the time for you to make this decision, however. I want you to sleep on it and make the decision in the morning. Tomorrow morning, after we have eaten breakfast, I shall take you into the studio and you shall hear the sound of the world. And only then will I allow you to make your decision. Do you have any objections? May I have a glass of whiskey now? I asked. He poured two large drams and handed one to me before holding up the other. He smiled broadly before touching my glass with his own and taking a drink. I set down my empty glass and said, You have given me much to think about. I thank you for your confidence in me. He stood up and directed me to my room. After lighting the lamp, he turned to leave, but before leaving, he said, I know much about you already, Scott. The honor would be mine, and I would go to my grave without fear. Then he walked out and slowly closed the door behind him, and I was left alone. I stood there in the middle of the room, stunned. I do not consider myself to be exceptionally wise, nor do I consider myself to be very important. I have a few friends, and much of my time is spent doing things that most people would take for granted. And I would not impress them very much with an account of my life. Imagine my shock after hearing these words. Finally, I went to the window and opened it. A wisp of cool air brushed against my face, and I felt it as a blow, for my nerves were raw. Never could I have envisioned this. My whole life was about to change if I were to accept this offer. But I was afraid. I was afraid to even think about it. It is often said that life is unpredictable, and I now know this to be true. Life is not something that one is. Life is not a state of being or a, a function of being. No, life is something that one does. We share this world together with people we do not know. We share this world with strangers, and we try to believe that simply by being alive, by simply interacting with these people, that we are connected, and that we share a common bond together. But there is no bond. Ironically, to bring us down even further, According to the laws of science, we are not only connected, but in a deeper way, we are part of and share the same matter that makes up our substance. We are identical, one, and in some strange way, the same person. 
I was having a hard time focusing my mind now for the weight of everything was just too heavy for me to bear without rest. But I also knew that I was alone with this decision and not my wife, my family, nor my brother Dan could help me to make this decision. The sheep were murmuring more than the fold and I had the impression that they were discussing me and what I was to do. You are safe, I said softly into the cool night air. On the nightstand was the remaining whiskey given to me by the driver. I poured the rest of the bottle into a glass and sat on the bed. Then I took out my phone and recorded this entry. My fifth day in Scotland, 